So hello everyone. Um, like Michelle has mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Wee Kiang. So I'm from uh, the Energy Market Authority and uh, my contact details are actually in that QR code that you see on screen. You can use it to get in touch with me or you can follow me on LinkedIn. I post quite a lot on energy issues and actually almost everything that I'm about to share today has probably been shared on LinkedIn by me in one form or another. So that's a great way for you to just keep in touch with uh, what EMA is doing on the Singapore energy transition. So a little bit of background about uh, the National Energy Transformation Office or NITO for short. Um, as the name suggests, we were started about five and a half years ago and uh, our aim then was really how to come up with a plan to convince people um, that Singapore could survive and thrive in a carbon constrained world. And so there was a lot of transformation effort needed, as you can imagine, to convince people that uh, indeed uh, we could do so. So I'm glad to say that in the five and a half years since the department was started, the transformation journey, you could say, has largely been done in the sense that there's no need to convince people now about the need to go to net zero. So everyone's convinced about that, everyone's fully on board. What we do now actually is to work out some of the implementation plans uh, in order to get to net zero. And my department primarily looks at two areas. Uh, I look at solar, which is the topic of my talk today. Uh, my side also looks at hydrogen, but today we're gonna just concentrate on solar. So on this slide, you actually see the, a slide on uh, what EMA does. And then let me just spend a little bit of time to just describe the three functions that EMA does, because I find that actually that's still not very widely known. So if you see at the top circle, we are what we call an industry regulator. Now, what does that mean? We basically regulate the electricity and gas industries, as well as uh, district cooling. The main touch point with Singaporeans really is on electricity. And that's where electricity, of course, is generated by the generating companies or what we call GenCos. We regulate them. We also regulate the national electricity market we also regulate the way that energy retailers actually sell electricity to customers, households such as you and I. So that's the industry regulator part. Now, the second thing that we do is we are a power systems operator. What does that mean? The grid has to be kept stable at all times in terms of being able to match demand and supply. And there are actually two entities that ensure grid stability. One is SP Group, Singapore Power, the other one actually is EMA. So what EMA does is we manage the transmission grid, which means for 66 kV voltages and above, that part of the grid is actually managed by EMA. And then SP Group manages what we call the distribution grid, which is 22 kV and below. Basically, that's the part of the electricity that enters into our house. The third thing that we do is what I call industry developer. And that's where we come up with a lot of the plans uh, for the energy transition, we look at how we are able to grow companies, create new good jobs for Singaporeans uh, as we proceed along this journey. So I do, can I go to the next slide, please? Yes. So this slide actually shows where EMA plays our role to keep the lights on and the gas flowing. So let me just move from left to right. So at the leftmost part, you actually see what we call our fuel mix. And you'll notice that actually natural gas comprises 95% of the fuel that we use for power generation. The remaining 5% is uh, made up mostly of uh, solar and what we call waste to energy, which is waste to energy is the way that we uh, incinerate our rubbish. And part of the byproducts of that is that we actually generate uh, some some electricity. And then solar is the, the one that I'm going to be talking about in the second half of my talk. It's rapidly growing, but as you can see, it's still very small. Solar's contribution to a fuel mix today is actually only slightly above 1%, but we expect to grow that quite a bit uh, over the next few years. But most of it, most of our fuel mix still comes from natural gas. And natural gas flows into Singapore in two forms. It flows in via what we call pipe natural gas, from Malaysia and from Indonesia. And then we also import liquefied natural gas or LNG from um, our uh, SLNG terminal on Jurong Island. So that's the fuel that we use for power generation. Now, if you move towards the right, you'll see what we call electricity generation. So those are the GenCos, the generating companies that I mentioned. 
And EMA doesn't actually operate any of the gen codes. What we do is we regulate them. But after the gen codes have generated the electricity, they have to be fed into the electricity grid, which is, you know, if you move uh, more to the right. And that's where I mentioned just now, as a power systems operator, EMA together with SP Group actually operates and runs the electricity grid. Now, the grid then, of course, extends to all the end-use consumers, of which households, you can see, 15%, right? So that's people like you and I. That's how electricity comes to our house. But in the grand scheme of things, you'll notice that households at 15% actually is quite a small part of total electricity consumption. The major part actually comes from uh, industry, factories, right? Which is at 42%. And then if you are in a commercial building and office building, actually those buildings actually take up a substantial amount of uh, the end use for electricity too at about 37%. So this is basically how electricity is uh, transmitted and distributed to customers and who the main customers are. Now for people like you and I, the households, we have been in recent years most uh, impacted by the open electricity market. That's the part where EMA actually open up competition so that uh, consumers had the choice to actually switch from SP Group to a retailer of your choice. And as you can see, by the end of 2022, end of last year, 40% of uh, what we call uh, non-contestable customers had switched to a retailer and a vast majority of them actually satisfied the service. Can you move to the next slide, please? Now, the power sector has to be in line with the national agenda to get to net zero by 2050. And in terms of our international climate change commitments, we actually have two timelines that we have to meet. The first one is the 2030, what we call Nationally Determined Contribution or NDC. And there you can see that we have actually internationally committed to two targets. One is we are going to peak our emissions at 60 million tons of CO2 equivalent. And then after that, by 2030, we will be no more than around 60 uh, million tons of CO2 equivalent. Okay, so we have to peak earlier than 2030, and then by 2030, we have to be around 60 million tons per CO2 equivalent. So that's a hard target that we have internationally committed. After that, for the next 20 years, okay, from 2030 to 2050, we have to bend the curve and bring that down essentially to zero because we have committed that we will achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Now, this is a really ambitious thing. Uh, it's a very ambitious and it's a difficult target to achieve, uh, but nationally, we have committed that we're going to have to do it. So the power sector is going to have to be decarbonized in line with these national net zero targets. So we ourselves, because we contribute about 40% of Singapore's uh, carbon emissions, will have to be aligned with these net zero timelines as well. Can you go to the next slide? So in order to do this, we commissioned a report which we call the Energy 2050 Committee Report. And I'm glad to say that the report after extensive study concluded that it is realistic for Singapore's power sector to aspire to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And you can Google for the link. Uh, it's a publicly available report. Uh, you should take a look at it because it doesn't present just one scenario on how we can get to net zero, but several scenarios. Because we simply don't know all the way to net 50, how exactly the world will pan out, international developments will pan out. But uh, we have considered a variety of scenarios. And the bottom line is we believe that it is realistic for us to get to net zero by 2050. Can we go to the next slide? So in in terms of specifically the power generation sector, we have something called the Singapore Energy Transition Plan. And what that really means is we have to look at this journey to get to net zero in three areas. One is the supply side, which I will talk about more shortly. But it's also very important to understand that the demand side has to be managed because there is no way that we can perpetually increase the supply of zero carbon electricity if the demand side keeps growing at an uncontrolled rate. It simply is not possible. Singapore inherently is what we call renewable energy disadvantage. So we don't have those vast resources that you see in other countries to put huge solar farms or wind farms. And uh, there are many other types of renewables that we simply don't have the resource of. 
So if demand keeps on growing, and as you can see from the previous slides, we have a very big demand, the supply can never catch up. So demand also has to be carefully managed so that the supply can eventually decarbonize and then bring us to net zero. The grid then also becomes a very important interface because in getting from the supply, the gen coals, to the demand, you need the grid to be ready. So all three facets of the energy transition have to be in place. Otherwise, we are not going to be able to meet the target. So let me talk specifically about the four supply switches that you can see on the right side of the screen. The four switches are one is natural gas, two solar, three regional power grids, and the fourth one is what we call emerging low carbon alternatives. Let me start with natural gas. Like I mentioned, natural gas today contributes 95% of our fuel mix. And we have studied this extensively. We believe that even throughout the transition and probably for a few decades more, it will still play a major role in the transition because it provides a reliable supply of energy. And that's something that I don't think it's going to change significantly. Certainly the share of natural gas will go down and it will be replaced by some of the other three switches, but it is simply not possible to just get off natural gas uh, immediately. It, it is really impossible. We have, we have considered a lot of scenarios uh, uh, about it. Uh, we still need it for a long time more. Now, if you move to solar, which I will talk about in greater detail later, it's our most re viable renewable energy source. And we have a target essentially by 2030 to reach at least two gigawatt peak of solar installed capacity. Okay, and I will explain later what two gigawatt peak means in practical terms, in terms of the amount of solar that's generated. The third one is uh, you see on the lower left hand uh, of the screen is what we call regional power grids. And there was a lot of uh, news reports last week, if you had you know, read about it, about how we have signed an MOU on regional energy cooperation with Indonesia. And that really is to help pave the way for us to import low carbon electricity from Indonesia and neighboring countries. And at the same time that we signed this MOU with Indonesia, uh, Keppel announced that uh, they had, or rather EMA announced that Keppel has been the first company to receive what we call a conditional approval to actually do large scale electricity imports. So this plan to import four gigawatts of low carbon electricity by 2035 is well in progress. And uh, you're getting, already you're starting to see some of the projects uh, proceeding in that direction. So that's the third switch that we have. Now these three switches by itself isn't gonna get us to net zero. So what we're gonna do is we're going to have a fourth switch, which is what we call emerging low carbon alternatives. And one of these low carbon alternatives is hydrogen, which is the other half of what my department does, but it could include other things like uh, geothermal as well. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, with that explanation, I think uh, maybe let's take a short break and uh, let's uh, watch a short video. I have it uh, on YouTube. This actually was a video that I filmed about three months ago. Uh, it's on. It is actually filmed by Mothership. Uh, it's on YouTube. If in case you want to take a look at it, but let's take a look at the video. It's five minutes. It tells you a little bit about solar and some of my thoughts on it. Singapore has been expanding its solar capacity in the past few years. Its goal is to deploy up to at least 2 gigawatt peak of solar capacity by 20. It's not the only solar farm we have, but it is the biggest. As of the second quarter of 2022, there are 5,733 solar installations in Singapore. 
generating a total installed capacity of 703 megawatt peak. This can generate enough energy to power up to 111,000 households for a year. Given that Singapore is so hot and sunny most of the time, have you ever wondered, why can't Singapore be powered by solar energy alone? Singapore has been expanding its solar capacity in the past few years. Its goal is to deploy up to at least 2 gigawatt peak of solar capacity by 2030, which could, over the course of a year, generate enough energy to power around 350,000 households for a year. But according to the Energy Market Authority's estimation, this will only account for 3% of Singapore's total electricity demand in 2030. Why are we aiming for so little? The biggest limitation we have is really one of land availability. So as a very small and very densely populated city-state, we don't have a lot of land. We don't have the sort of vast land areas that you see in countries like Australia to deploy huge solar farms. And while we think of Singapore as hot and sunny, it's often cloudy or rainy as well. So solar power is what we call intermittent, meaning that it's not always available when you need it. So obviously it's uh, not available at night, but even during the day when it's sunny like this, if you have a cloud cover or sudden storms, it can really cause the solar output to drop drastically. There are three main considerations Singapore has when developing energy policies. These considerations are what is called the energy trilemma. So the energy trilemma means that we have to balance three often conflicting objectives. And the three objectives are sustainability, energy security, and affordability. Solar energy is definitely a greener source of energy, and the costs are comparable or even lower than using gas to generate electricity now. But what solar is not so great at is on the energy security angle. Obviously, being a domestic renewable source, it does help us a little bit in terms of being more energy independent, but it's not generating at the kind of scale that we need to fully displace conventional generation. To ensure a reliable supply of power 24-7, Singapore still uses natural gas for most of its electricity generation, around 95% to be exact. So 20 years ago, when we were considering a move away from the more pollutive fuel oil for power generation, we settled on natural gas because at that point in time, renewables were either too nascent or too expensive. And natural gas for a long time has help us to meet all three legs of the energy trilemma. But because natural gas has to be imported, developments in other parts of the world, such as rising global energy demand post-pandemic, and even the war in Ukraine, can push up energy prices here. So natural gas is an internationally traded commodity, and we import all the natural gas that we need for power generation. So we are dependent on uh, global price movements. If the price increases globally, then it will translate to higher prices here in Singapore too. At the same time, Singapore is looking to achieve net zero by 2050. The main concern, I guess, is that natural gas is a fossil fuel. So it does emit greenhouse gas emissions when burned. And as we aim to get to net zero by 2050, we're going to have to find a way either to abate those emissions or to find a cleaner burning fuel to replace natural gas. With the power sector accounting around 40% of Singapore's emissions, Singapore is also considering other green energy sources besides solar. A report by the Energy 2050 Committee stated that Singapore is considering low-carbon electricity imports, hydrogen, and geothermal energy as alternative energy sources. Singapore is looking to import a capacity of up to 4 gigawatts of low-carbon electricity by 2035, which could make up around 30% of Singapore's projected energy supply then. More recently, the government has outlined Singapore's national hydrogen strategy, where low-carbon hydrogen could potentially supply up to half of Singapore's power needs by 2050. So in evaluating any future energy source, we're always looking to see how we can better balance the trilemma. Singapore is what we call renewable energy disadvantage, meaning that we just do not have a lot of renewable energy resources. Uh, we have a lot of sunlight, so solar is our most promising source, but because we have very little land, deploy solar. Ultimately, it can only account for perhaps 10% of our uh, electricity demand. Yeah, so all options are on the table. In the race to get to net zero, I think we can't afford to rule out anything at this moment in time. I liken this whole energy transition to performing open heart surgery on a patient while the patient is still running a marathon. It's a very complex task that will take many years in the making. In the meantime, there are things the government does to help Singaporeans mitigate the cost. These include use safe rebates to offset higher electricity prices and provide some relief to households. The cheapest form of energy is the energy that we don't use. So even as we try as fast and as much to accelerate the energy transition, we have to keep a watch on energy demand because we can't let demand grow in an uncontrolled fashion. So what can we do in the meantime? Just start saving electricity. Every little bit counts. Buy more energy-efficient appliances, 
Use the fan more, use the aircon less. Turn off the water heater when you're not using it. Every little bit counts. So that's the five minute video. That's my pitch on solar. And if I can just ask the host to move to the next slide. So this next part of the, the, the presentation, this will take us all the way until the Q&A, is actually on solar itself. Uh, solar is one, one of my favorite topics. I can spend a long time talking about it. Uh, let me start off by just explaining a little bit on the basics of solar so that everyone understands the terminology and understands uh, what, what is it we are talking about. It's important to understand some of the terminology so that uh, we, we understand what is being said. So let, let, let's move from, you know, uh, by numerical order. So solar irradiance, if you see this term uh, being used, uh, basically it just uh, means the amount of uh, solar power that is, um, that is received on the ground. And obviously it differs from uh, country and from location. Actually, Singapore has a pretty good solar irradiance, as you can imagine, because uh, we're near, near the equator, so you get lots of sunlight, but at the same time, our irradiance is not as high as some desert areas because uh, we have a lot of clouds. We have a lot of rain, we have a lot of clouds. The best places in the world actually to do solar are in places like in Australia, whereby it's, uh, it's just dry and it's desert and uh, there's hardly any clouds and it's just sunny all year round. Those actually have the best irradiance in the world. But we are pretty good still, all right, on being, being uh, on the equator. Now, how do solar panels work? Basically, solar panels convert the sunlight into what we call direct current or DC electricity. And the installed capacity, and you'll see this term being mentioned over and over again, we measure it in something called either kilowatt or megawatt peak. So you see the, word, uh, the, the words uh, KW with a small p or MW with a small p, the p stands for peak. What, why is this important? The reason is because solar panels do not generate at peak power most of the time. They generate peak power when there is maximum sunlight. Obviously, once there is rain, once there's clouds, uh, they won't generate anything at you know, resembling a peak power. So if you look at the int what we call intraday solar yield curve, it, it basically is like a, a, a sort of curve that's sort of like, you know, it goes up and down. You can imagine between 11 to maybe 3 p.m., 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., uh, solar generation uh, will be near its peak but uh, earlier in the morning later on in the afternoon it really starts uh, dropping off uh, drastically so solar panels don't generate a peak uh, for more than a few hours a day at best right so it's important to understand that when we talk about kilowatt or megawatt peak you can't directly compare it to say a uh, natural gas combined cycle uh, gas turbine because that basically can run at 100 percent peak power if it chooses to so that's something that you have to bear in mind for solar. The install capacity could look very big, but the actual energy yield compared to what we call a base load energy plant, uh, uh, actually in comparison is much smaller. So let's go to number three, all right? So the, the, the electricity that's, uh, um, that's generated is what we call direct current. And then it has to pass through something called an inverter. An inverter is needed to convert DC electricity to alternating current or AC electricity, because that is the electricity that is sent into the grid and which comes into our household. All the electricity that we get from SP Group today is DC electricity, right? So if you're connected to the grid, you, you, you are basically getting uh, AC electricity. So the DC electricity from the solar panels have to be converted using an inverter. And then, uh, in, like in number four, uh, the solar output, uh, after being converted to AC electricity, they can be what we call self-consumed first by the building where the panels are sitting uh, with the excess then being sold back into a grid. And so this is where you have to distinguish installed capacity is a unit of power. That's why it's in kilowatt or megawatt peak. But energy is in kilowatt hour or megawatt hour, okay? Because that's the unit of energy. So you just have to keep some of these things in mind, right? Can you go to the next slide? Now, during the video, I talked about the trilemma. And uh, just to recap, uh, again, trilemma has three legs. Uh. It has the affordability leg, it has the, the sustainability leg, and then it also has the energy security leg. 
So I won't talk too much about the the sustainability leg because uh, maybe we all understand, right? Solar energy generates uh, no carbon emissions uh, when it's generating. So that's easily understood. What about affordability? Solar cost has been declining and is now generally cheaper than grid electricity prices. I say generally cheaper because at the height of the pandemic, when wholesale electricity prices were at its lowest, there were some forms of solar, the very big installations that was even then at or even slightly cheaper than grid electricity prices, but smaller household size like on landed property installations uh, would not have been cheaper than the wholesale electricity prices. But generally as a whole, right, if you are a commercial industrial customer, even back then, most likely if you had installed solar, it will be cheaper than drawing electricity from the grid. Now today, grid electricity prices are much higher than three years ago. So I can say with confidence, whatever the size of your solar system today, all right, in March 2023, is almost certainly cheaper and grid electricity prices, which is why if, if you have a roof, uh, please install solar. Now the security part needs to be explained a little bit further. Solar energy is domestic. We don't require any import of fuel, so it helps us to be a little bit more energy independent. So that's great, all right? From a security point of view, it helps us to be a little bit more secure. But there's a problem. It's intermittent. It's not always available when you need it, and we have limited areas to deploy solar. So on the whole security, energy security is that part of solar that it doesn't score so well in. So over the next few slides, I'll explain some of these concepts a little bit more in detail. Can you go to the next slide? The next slide actually shows the price of solar. On the left, you see average spot prices of our PV modules. It's really been plunging, okay? It's been plunging almost 90% over the last decade. So it's getting cheaper and cheaper. But if you look at the right side, you'll see that actually the, the system cost is starting to taper off and basically is starting to plateau off. Now, why is that? It's really because the module cost is only about 25% of the total system cost. Remember I talked about you need things like the inverter to convert DC to AC electricity. Obviously you need people scaffolding to install the solar. You need cabling, you need the mounting. All these actually will cost money, even if the modules are free. So solar, obviously we expect the modules to continue to drop a little bit in price, but if you think about it after 90% drop, I don't think that there's a lot more that you can drop. But the rest of the cost, the cost of the labor, the cost of the scaffolding, the cost of the inverter, the aluminum, I don't think those will drop a lot, which is why you see the system capex starts to taper off. And a little bit small on the slides here, but Essentially, what those different colored lines show is that the highest cost will be by the smaller installations. And most likely those are the ones that are put on lender houses. Uh, the lowest cost are those that are very big, ground mounted, that could be a few megawatt peak in size, for example. Next slide, please. And as uh, solar costs have dropped, obviously deployment has skyrocketed. Uh, in 2012, we had about 10 megawatt peak of install capacity. Um, by 2022, third quarter, we had 742. So we have seen a solar growth of around 70 times in the last decade, and it will just keep growing. Next slide, please. I talked a little bit about security just now. Let me just mention a little bit about intermittency. We have a lot of solar intermittency because we have a lot of cloud cover and fluctuating weather conditions. And those weather conditions include sudden storms like your Sumatran squalls that can sweep across the island and uh, we could have totally zero or almost zero solar output for hours or perhaps even days on end, like we experienced uh, earlier this month when I think we had two days of continuous rain. So there's a lot of fluctuation in solar output over a course of a day or over a course of a few days. The grid has to balance supply and demand at all times in order for it to remain stable. Now, if the supply which is coming from solar is going to be intermittent at almost a second by second or at least a minute by minute uh, time scale, then how do we balance this? Because we just cannot predict it down to minute by minute or second by second, right? So we need things uh, which we call energy storage systems or ESS to help us balance it. And what they really do is they 
basically take on solar when it is being produced is then stored in the battery and when the solar output from the panels drop the batteries can discharge the output and so uh, even out the fluctuations in solar output so essentially that's what um, uh, ESS do and it's not limited to lithium ion batteries uh, lithium ion batteries are the most established technology but there are also other technologies like flow batteries and in fact even uh, in countries that have uh, 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 geographical fi uh, features that allow you to build uh, reservoirs up in highlands you have what we call pump hydro hydropower pump hydropower energy storage system so there are many ways to store energy not not just necessary in lithium ion batteries but we have actually been deploying lithium ion batteries in a substantial way if you follow some of the news uh, reports you will have seen that SAMCOP actually completed its ESS about two months ago and what it did really was it deployed an ESS on Jurong Island uh, that is the equivalent of 285 megawatt hours in capacity so we will have more ESS over time because as the solar uh, installed capacity increases the amount of intermittency also increases so we need more ESS to help balance the system in addition to many other things that we are doing can we have the next slide the other thing that I need to explain a little bit more is how much land is actually required if you want to generate an equivalent amount of energy using solar compared to the natural gas uh, turbines that we have today and you may be surprised the answer is possibly as much as 300 times how do i get this figure okay take a look at the slide all right if you look at the combined cycle gas turbine or what we call a ccgt and let's say this is the biggest that's available 800 megawatts right it's a huge uh, ccgt typically the land required for that if you round it about 10 hectares now i did some calculations if a solar farm were to generate an equivalent amount of energy as the CCGT, taking into account what we call the normal capacity factors for the CCGT, because the CCGT is also, it, it cannot run 24 7 all year round. It also has downtime for maintenance, outages, and so forth. So every form of generation has some kind of capacity factor. But if you equalize it and you assume certain things on the area factor, I calculated you'll need about 4.7 gigawatt peak of solar PV to generate the same amount of energy as a 800 megawatt CCGT. And that amounts to about 36 square kilometers or 3,600 square, 3,600 hectares of solar, of surface area for solar. So you can imagine, even if we plaster the whole of Singapore on every feasible surface for solar, there is simply no way that we can replace all of today's conventional generation with solar. It is simply not possible. We have done the mathematics. We have done 3D mapping of the entire country. We know exactly where in Singapore we can deploy solar. We have mapped it all out. And as the video mentioned, we think that at 2050, we have a technical potential about 10 times more than what we have today. And even then, it will only generate about 10%, slightly less than 10%, in fact, of our natural, national electricity demand in 2050. So that's some of the realities on solar that we need to just be aware of. Next slide, please. Okay, having said all that, solar is still our most promising and viable renewable energy source, and we are committed to maximize it as much as possible. So that's something that my department is in charge of. We're in charge of the national solar deployment targets. I talked about at least two gigawatt peak by 2030. Actually, we do have a nearer term target, which is 1.5 gigawatt peak of solar installed capacity by 2025. So where will you see it? I will show some pictures in the last few slides on where you can actually look out for solar. But basically, you'll see solar today, of course, on rooftops. HDB is doing a fantastic job in what we call solarizing all HDB blocks where feasible and those amount to thousands of blocks so you're going to see them on rooftops hdb blocks commercial buildings uh, factories and so off and, and so forth and then the facades the sides of these buildings could also host solar panels in the form of what we call building applied pv BAPV, or building integrated pv where it actually can be a replacement for the curtain walls 
or for the, the the cladding of the buildings right so this is the the, the next frontier where you have even the size of the building uh, generating solar energy then of course we have floating solar and i'll show you some photos of some of the places where you can see floating solar uh, we are actually going offshore too floating solar actually has gone onto the sea again i'll show you a photo later on and then where there's land that's temporarily vacant and that we are not developing it over the next few years we have also put solar uh, there uh, with understanding with the developer that when we need the land we will just remove the solar and the solar panels can be relocated to another site so with all these being done at 742 megawatt peak as at third quarter last year we are already one of the most solar dense cities in the world that's something that i think not many people understand uh, but we do because we are in the business and i always emphasize this statistic because when people say oh, i'm not sure whether singapore is doing a lot on renewable energy please take my word for it we are and i think we compare very well with any other city in the world in terms of our renewable energy deployment next slide please okay so let's just look at some photos so that you after you leave this webinar you have some idea where you might be able to see solar uh, take my word for it it's all around you right if you just look you'll see it after this webinar i'm sure you'll you'll start to see it more and more so of course uh if you're fortunate enough you stay in a landed house uh, please put solar and increasingly uh this is really happening my own house i installed solar last year which is why that statement that you see on screen that says that the average payback is six to seven years at current electricity prices i am very confident that this is accurate because I've done the calculations myself. All right, I installed it last year. I have almost one year's worth of solar data. I know six to seven years is accurate. So considering that the panels last 25 years, the inverter lasts at least 10 years, really at six to seven years payback, this is a really good investment. So if you have a landed property with a roof uh, and you can install solar, please do so. Like I mentioned, uh, HDB blocks also have uh, solar. Uh, commercial industrial buildings also have solar and if you happen to be studying at uh, some of our universities you'll see uh, on the lower left hand side NTU campus actually is extensively solarized uh, a drone shot from above actually shows you how solarized NTU is and uh, NUS is uh, not 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 going to be left behind uh, they already have a building like SDE4 it's a net zero energy building and the campus as a whole is also going to be deploying a lot more solar over the next few years on the right side of the of, of, of the slide you can see PSA Twasport and MIM building this is an example of what we call vertical PV so you can see the facades of the building you, you, you almost can't tell that it's solar right all you see is just a black facade it looks like cladding actually those are solar panels and uh, because uh, PSA Tua Spot is in a very open and unshaded area, it's a uh, solar energy yield for the vertical facades uh, is very good. But if you're in Changi Business Park, if you take a look at the Keppel Infrastructure Building, uh, the facades also are solar panels. So they're there also. So they're not just uh, at some remote area. If you happen to be at Changi Business Park, uh, do, do take a look at it. Can you look at the next slide? For HDB blocks, if you really want to see the solar panels just look up <laughs> they are there and increasingly i think they are more visible uh these pictures are actually at Pasiris because that's where i stay as you can see the solar panels are not flat on the roof per se they are slightly raised and they're slightly raised so that they can do two things one we can build them all the way to the edge maximizing the surface area and also it allows for easier maintenance and also better airflow under the panels that keeps the panels cooler and uh, when panels are cooler, they're actually more efficient in generating uh, electricity. All right. So the HDB blocks, they were solarized under a program by HDB called Solar Nova. And Solar Nova right now has awarded seven tenders. With the completion of Solar Nova 7, eventually 8,400 HDB blocks will be solarized. And the total number of HDB blocks in Singapore is slightly above 10,000. So you can see we really are putting every effort into solarizing HDB blocks as much as possible. And if you look up, I'm very sure that your block either has or will soon have uh, solar panels on it. Now, obviously, the electricity that's on top of the HDB block doesn't go into 
the households like you and me, right? It goes actually to power the common services. So the town council benefits from having cheaper electricity. But this is a way that solar power is actually benefiting all of us. If you go to the Singapore Discovery Center at uh, Jurong, you actually see a solar walkway. I put this uh, picture on because most people, when they walk underneath it, they wouldn't even know that it's solar, right? It doesn't look anything like a solar panel. It just looks like something that's patterned, but actually this is a solar panel. And at the length of 196 meters, this is actually the longest sheltered walkway fitted solar panels in Singapore. So if you're somewhere near Jurong, next to Safti, uh, please drop into the Singapore Discovery Center. You see this just around the main entrance. Can you go to the next slide? I talked about solar land. This is a uh, solar on temporarily vacant land. Uh, we have a few phases. Some of these places are a little bit remote, so not so easy to get to. Uh, phase one is on Jurong Island, so it's restricted access. You can't get to there easily. Phase two is actually a Changi Business Park. If you drive by the PIE next to Changi Business Park, you actually will be able to see it. So keep an eye out for it next time you are on the PIE. Uh, solar land phase three, this is at Tuas. So again, a little bit remote, but if you want to, you can, you can see it too. And then if you are anywhere near Bendemir MRT, take a look. Right outside the entrance is a solar farm, right next to Bendemir MRT. So this is an example of a land that is currently unused that, you know, we took advantage of it and let's put some solar panels and generate as much clean energy as we can. Okay, next slide, please. Reservoirs also has solar panels. Tengye Reservoir is next to Tuas Checkpoint. A little bit difficult to get to, but you might be able to see it if you're ever coming back from Malaysia over the second link. Just take a look on the left-hand side. You might be able to see the panels. It's a very big installation, 60 megawatt peak, which means that it's about maybe 40 hectares. So huge installation. You want somewhere that's a little bit nearer, go to Bedok Reservoir. Right? If you walk around Bedok Reservoir, the the, the site that is now uh, where the home team, uh, NS, the sort of clubhouse is, you actually see a 1.5 megawatt peak installation there that's uh, actually powering the Bedok pumping station and Bedok Waterworks. If you're near Sunoco, near Woodlands, you can see the Woodlands uh, near shop uh, 5 megawatt peak panel uh, system. This is actually a, a marine system, it's offshore. So it's not like the reservoir systems that's on fresh water. This is actually out on the sea. So it has to be able to take rougher conditions. And of course, it has to be able to, to, to be ruggedized to operate in a marine environment. But this is the next frontier of solar. And because the sea, you have waves, you have winds, it's a lot rougher. We need to have structures that the solar panels can sit on. Uh, they'll have to be a lot more stable. And that's where we are trying to test out different designs and you can see what on the slide one of the innovative membrane nearshore pv floating designs that is being tested off Jurong island okay next slide please and how about on some of our transport infrastructure our depots uh mrt depots actually have solar on the roof bus depots have solar on the roof uh, overhead bridges I'm told by LTA that some of them have uh, solar on the overhead bridges too. And then a few months ago, uh, there apparently was a trial, a successful trial by uh, one of the bus companies that actually had put solar on the top of the buses. And uh, they said that actually it had a payback of just a few years, which to be frank, surprised me because I didn't expect it to be so good, but I'm pleasantly surprised. And uh, you'll see more solar panels on more buses. So even buses can, can, can hold solar panels. Next slide, please. So the next slide. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one slide back. Sorry. Yes, this one. So you also see solar on other infrastructure, skylights, off-grid solar at Ubin, coastal fish farms, like those that are off Pasir Ris car ports uh, near MBS, the waterfront promenade breeze shelter. We are slowly bringing solar down to eye level. So now it's on roofs. A lot of times you won't be able to see it unless you really look out for it, but soon they're going to come down to eye level. And I think if you take a look at the photos, they, they don't look ugly, at least not to me. I think they look quite pleasing. They integrate quite well with the architecture. 
and uh, you'll be seeing a lot more of these uh, in, in time to come. Next slide, please. And solar panels, they, they don't actually come in your conventional shapes and uh, colors. They almost can be any design or colors uh, that you want it to be. Of course, it will affect the efficiency, but you can see uh, this thing called Pranakan PV. It's uh, done by the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore, Ceres. And uh, yeah, they can basically make it uh, into any more kind of motif or mural that you want. Uh, and you can place it on the sides of buildings. Then you'll blend it very nicely because it won't look industrial or ugly in any way. Uh, solar panels can be any color you want. And if you're willing to accept uh, slightly higher cost, low efficiency, you can even print uh, the equivalent of murals and photographs on it. Uh, the ones on the left, actually those are actually solar panels uh, that are in Switzerland. Next slide, please. So this last part of my presentation, I just want to just very briefly just talk about some of the economic opportunities. So I've talked about solar, why we want to do it, how much more we want to do, but what does it mean to, to you and me besides the fact that it's generating clean energy? Well, there are lots of uh, jobs that will be in the entire value chain of solar. It just, it won't just be in the developer side, right? Which is the installers. Uh, we actually manufacture solar panels. REC manufactures solar panels at Tuas. And then, of course, after the thing is installed, you need companies that will come in to do O&M, operations and maintenance. They'll need to keep the systems optimized. And lots of companies, lots of good jobs are in that area. And then finally, when the panels reach end of use, they have to be recycled. And increasingly, you're seeing a lot of these solar panel recycling companies, just as you're starting to see companies um, that are starting up in battery recycling. Now, of course, if you're in the consulting line, if you're working in a bank, these are all needed to finance and uh, to do the design uh, for solar panels or even to generate uh, uh, renewable energy certs for the credits, for example. Next slide, please. So we expect to create a lot of good jobs for Singaporeans. The 55,000 jobs that you see on the left, uh, that's not limited to solar alone, obviously. That's uh, really across the entire clean energy economy. But this gives you an idea. This is a sunrise industry. So whether it's solar, whether it's ESS, whether it's grid related, we will create a lot of good jobs of Singaporeans in the years ahead. So if you're thinking what to study, if you're thinking maybe is this something that you want to move into, lots of opportunities, uh, please read a lot of the materials that are available on the government websites whereby we have actually put out some of the opportunities that are available to Singaporeans. Next slide, please. And this is an example of a successful homegrown solar company, Sunseep. They were acquired last year by a Portuguese company called EDPR. So they are now called EDPR Sunseep. And uh, they were bought over uh, for 1.1 billion Singapore dollars. So it's a huge sum of money. But as a result of that, EDPR is a big presence now in Asia, uh, headquarters in Singapore, because the Singapore company is basically the Asia Pacific headquarters. And they have huge plans to deploy billions of dollars in uh, clean energy pro projects uh, by 2030 throughout the Asia Pacific region. So again, these are all just examples of opportunities in clean energy in Singapore and in the region. Next slide, please. Okay, my final slide. All right, I'll just leave you with three taglines. One, solar is necessary for us to get to net zero. Solar is beneficial to your bottom line. Again, if you have a roof, if you stay in a house, please install solar. It, it really pays for itself. And solar is everywhere. Uh, just look out for it. You'll be surprised, I think, after today's webinar, when you look out, you actually see uh, how much solar there is. So I'll leave you with this slide and also a next slide that has uh, some details on some of the resources um, that are available in case you want to install solar please look out for these links and yeah let's take a look and maybe some of the q and a's now thanks um we can i think your lively uh, sharing on solar has generated a lot of interest so i'll just go through the questions la. i mean you can take a look as well but i think some of the main questions is how much else can we um surface area can we um utilize in Singapore to um put the solar panels? I think someone was asking about putting it on um schools, right? Um, putting it on some of our sheltered walkways, even potentially um working with BCA, right, to make it compulsory for developers to install these solar panels. Um, yeah, so just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. 
Yeah, so, so that's an excellent question. So in fact, we are trying to work with the various agencies to put solar on walkways. Uh, like I mentioned, SDC already has a solar, uh, basically a solar panels on the walkway. We are trying to, to work to see whether we can put solar panels on walkways as canopies, as shelters uh, within our residential areas because it really serves two purposes. One, it, it generates electricity and secondly, it provides shade to the residents, which is increasingly something that I think a lot of town councils value. Mm. So we are trying to do that and uh, hopefully soon you'll be able to see more of these things happening. Um, where else can we put it? We definitely are trying to encourage as many building owners as possible to put it on uh, their roofs and if possible on the facades. I think a lot of the, the roofs that are in Jurong, in Tuas, the industrial roofs with very flat, very unshaded uh, kind of uh, surface areas would be actually perfect for solar. I mean, wherever I pass through Jurong and Tuas, I always look and I just imagine what if uh, many more building owners put solar. Unfortunately, it's still a little bit of a minority, uh, but I'm hoping that uh, that will change over the next few years. Now, how much can we actually do going forward? Well, our technical potential, like I mentioned, by 2050, is about eight gigawatt peak of solar, which is slightly over 10 times more what we have. So that's kind of like the total amount, the absolute max amount of uh, solar that we can put uh, in this country while balancing across certain trade-offs. Like for example, I mean, we can't put solar over the entire surface area of our reservoirs, for example, right? Because uh, some parts of it are needed for recreational activities. Uh, some parts, you know, you need the reservoir to be open uh, for biodiversity. You, you, you just can't cover everything. It will affect the ecology and things like that. So we've been very careful to, to, to balance energy generation with many other uses for surfaces in Singapore. Even the roofs, for example, I mean, roofs can be used for recreation. You know, I mean, sometimes there are like exercise facilities on the roof. Uh, people use roofs for urban farming. Uh, for urban greenery. So we have to find a way to coexist and uh, we are trying to do as much as we can to maximize every feasible surface. Thank you so much. Um, I think that was quite an interesting question by one of our attendees, which is in terms of encouraging um, installation of solar panels, are there any um, funds or grants um, or acknowledgement you know, that would incentivize people to adopt um, the solar panels? Yeah. yeah, so that's another excellent question. The <laughs> short answer to that actually is that no, we don't have any grants uh, anymore or any incentives for that matter for solar because solar has reached what we call grid parity. So remember that slide that I showed that actually showed that solar already is cheaper uh, than grid electricity. Because of that, uh, we don't think that there's a need to really have any kind of special uh, financial support for solar. And as a general rule, the Singapore government has always tended not to have any special incentive schemes for any particular kind of energy. And the reason for this is very simple. We want to have every form of energy bear what we call its full cost. We don't want to artificially distort the market to have one type of energy be favored over the other. Now you may say, well, solar, you know, being clean, shouldn't we favor it? Yes, we do. We already favor it in terms of the carbon tax. So the carbon tax already is one way that solar energy will be more advantage compared to conventional generation. As you know, the carbon tax uh, is going to go up to $25 per ton uh, in 2024, and then eventually it will go up uh, a lot more by 2030. So, so, so that, that advantage is, will, will keep on growing. So, so that's the way that we favor solar energy. I mean, favor in inverted commas. But at the same time, like I shared, Solar energy is intermittent. It does cost money to balance that intermittency. So something also needs to be assigned to solar energy to account for the cost of the intermittency. And I think when, when you have these positive and negative externalities being taken care of, then the, the energy competes uh, on its own basis fairly. And I'm very sure that even when you put all this together, actually solar will come across looking very competitive. So just it, it really will be worth your while. I mean, to anyone that has a roof to really just install solar at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your detailed answer. Um, I think we have another question, which is um, more specific to, I think, um, EMA. 
So I think beyond uh, solar energy, I think Simon asked this question um, that are there any plans to uh, invest in other types of nascent technologies, such as I think the person was talking about pump thermal energy storage and small modular reactor. Sorry, it's quite technical. So I'm just like reading off the screen. Yeah, so hmm. okay, so so pump thermal energy storage. Uh, okay, let, let's try and break it into two, 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 two segments. Uh. There's thermal energy storage and there's a variety of ways that we can store energy uh, thermally, right? You can either store it in terms of something that gets very hot, right? And there are certain types of sometimes uh, also a newfangled technologies today uh, that, 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 that store energy in the form of heat, uh, heated bricks, uh, heated sand, molten salts and so forth. So that's one way. Now we can also store energy in terms of it being coal. That's what we call coal energy. And in fact, uh, Singapore District Cooling, they actually have uh, thermal energy storage, which is basically storing in, in the form of cold water. Uh, or ice storage, uh, which they do at uh, Marina Bay. So there's a district cooling plant at uh, Marina Bay, actually, for many years, they already have a uh, thermal energy storage. So that's the thermal part of it. Now, the pump part of it, I'm, I'm just assuming this refers more to like pump hydro. Huh? And again, we have always said that uh, Singapore is very flat, right? There's no geographical elevation difference, so you cannot do pump hydro. But if you look at from about a month ago, we actually there was a newspaper article that said that actually PUB in studying this thing called underground drainage and a reserve system actually are looking at studying the possibility of digging underground reservoirs uh, one below the other and that then actually allows you to store energy in the surface reservoir which is the one on top right and then when the water is released into the underground reservoir then obviously it turns a turbine and then it generates electricity so then you can then store energy by pumping up water from the, the lower reservoir back to the upper reservoir. So that's a possible way that uh, we have never thought of. We always said that we have no mountains, so there's no way to do hydropower, but this is a possibility we are studying whether it's feasible where hydropower in the form of pump hydro storage uh, may be possible. Now, the last, the last part of the question talk about small modular reactors. So, so nuclear is a... <laughs> It's a huge topic. Uh, I'm not an expert in it, but we, we, that, that is a topic I can spend another hour talking about it. Uh, I think suffice to say that for nuclear, uh, we have concluded 10 years ago that the current large-scale nuclear technology that you see deployed elsewhere in the world, uh, those are not suitable for Singapore for a variety of reasons, but we are keeping uh, all options on the table. We are, we are uh, watching out for new technologies, what we call uh, Generation 4. Uh, advanced nuclear reactors and also small nuclear, uh, small modular reactors. So, so those are something that uh, we're just studying at the moment. Wow, thank you, thank you, Yang. Um, I think there was a question on uh, hydrogen, so I thought that would be good to address. Okay, so because I think earlier on you mentioned the four energy um, switches, right? And um, I recall that hydrogen was one of them. So I think um, the question was that, are there any plans for Singapore to explore blue or green hydrogen as a source of energy? Okay, so hydrogen, uh, I love that topic because that's the other half of what I do. Uh, <laughs> again, it'll take one hour to do a full, full webinar on hydrogen. So I think the easiest way to, to explain it is that yes, we are looking at hydrogen uh, as potentially a significant part of our fuel mix. So when the Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong uh, at last October unveiled our national hydrogen strategy, he said that hydrogen could potentially contribute up to half of our fuel mix. And that gives you an idea of how big hydrogen may be eventually, because remember at this moment in time, uh, natural gas contributes 95%. So after you take away what we could contribute from solar, what we may get from uh, electricity imports, uh, we don't have a lot of other choices, which is why hydrogen may have to contribute a large part of the remainder. And that's kind of like how we got this uh, up to 50% figure. So hydrogen has a big role. Uh, my department is actively studying it. So just uh, keep a lookout for announcements over the next months and years because there'll be many, many things uh, happening on hydrogen. Now on blue and green hydrogen, basically these different colors of hydrogen just refer to the different ways that they are uh, the hydrogen is manufactured. So hydrogen today doesn't exist in uh, elemental form on Earth. 
uh, is usually bound up with something else. And uh, green hydrogen simply means that uh, we do electrolysis uh, using renewable energy to produce hydrogen from water, right? So because water is H2O, so the, the H2 part is, <laughs> is how you get hydrogen. And then blue hydrogen is uh, basically getting hydrogen from uh, natural gas, uh, except that the CO2 emissions that are a result of that process, we find a way to basically store those CO2 emissions in the ground so that in a way they are net zero. So that's why it's called blue hydrogen. So so there are many different colors of hydrogen because these are just two ways to produce hydrogen. Uh, there are many actually uh, other ways and uh, then they take the form of many different colors. But like I said, it uh, takes a lot more than uh, five minutes to, to de describe this in more detail. So uh, may maybe another webinar <laughs> would be yeah, needed. I think it looks like we have here. to do more webinars with our EME because there's a lot of interest. I think maybe the final question, because I'm mindful of time, we've talked about a lot about the supply side, right? Like how um, we're going to increase supply. But I think you mentioned a very good point, which is that ultimately we also have to look at our demand side because if we don't bring down that demand, the supply is never going to catch up. Yeah. So just curious, would there be any, um, are there any tips that you have for us as, you know, consumers? How can we um, reduce our own demand, like, essentially? And um, also, are there any, is there anything that EMA is doing to try to encourage, you know, um, people to lower their demand for electricity, in essence? Yeah, yeah so what we have found is that, uh, I, I think that demand reduction is something that, people must feel motivated to do. Let me explain. So we have had various trials on what we call smart meters. Smart meters actually tell you, you know, over the course of a month, how much are you using and that, that, that data can be broken down uh, by the day, by the half hour. It does give you a lot of information about when you are consuming electricity uh, within a household uh, and what you could possibly do. But we found that actually smart meters by themselves don't actually lead to a lot of behavioral change. So I've come to a personal conclusion that giving more information to people doesn't actually move the needle very much. What needs to move the needle is when people feel that climate change is a serious problem and each of us have a role to play no matter how small because every little bit done by every single person counts. It's like saving water, right? For years, for decades, we've been drumming through all these water conservation programs by PUB, such that today, if you see a tap that is uh, running, someone will definitely switch it off, right? Nobody will just leave the tap running. And if you see that maybe a tap is in an inaccessible area, but it's running for no reason, somebody will, will, will call and will do something about it. Uh. You can be sure someone will stomp it, uh, right? And, and, and someone will say something about it, but you don't see the same thing regarding energy. Lights are left on, aircon left on. Nobody seems to, you know, really pay much attention to it. I think a lot of that thinking, that culture has to shift and it has to begin with us. So there are appliances, there are devices in time to come that can help us to save a bit more energy by giving us more information, maybe by automatically controlling certain of our appliances. But I think at the end of the day, it, it all comes down to the individual. You must want to save it and you must be the sort that when you see something, you know, the lights on for no good reason, you must want to turn it off. And I think when, when that happens, uh, we will already be able to move into uh, more a, a greater energy conservation mode and then we'll be able to control the demand a little bit better. So every bit helps. Uh, households, in the grand scheme of things, only contribute 50 per, I mean, we only use 15% of electricity. So a large part of the energy reduction will have to become, will have to come from commercial buildings in factories. And, and on, on that area, I think NEA, uh, EMA, EDB, we're all collectively doing a lot to encourage companies to be a lot more energy efficient.